Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? So, I don't know exactly where it started, but there seems to have been a complete resurgence in the blood flow theory, also more commonly known as the blood flow theory. Now, unless you are brand new to the good fight against the slaphead curse, then chances are you already have heard of the blood flow theory. But in case you don't know what it is, it basically is just a pseudoscientific and debunked claim that hair loss is caused by poor blood circulation to the scalp due to things like scalp tension and and what proponents of this so-called theory will point out often is that the pattern of hair loss matches the patterns of the greatest scalp tension, and thus this somehow proves that hair loss is caused due to poor blood circulation in these regions. The blood flu theory proponents have tried to back up their claims by promoting studies that show things like increased scalp tension and lower oxygen levels on the top of the scalp compared to the sides of the head. This is, of course, complete bro science since it doesn't explain why androgenic alopecia has a big genetic component, so scam artists who promote bullshit products that don't work modify the theory to say that the oxygen levels in the scalp affect the DHT levels since an environment with more blood and oxygen means more testosterone is more likely to aromatize into estrogen, which is actually good for the hair, rather than convert into the trash hormone DHT, which of course destroys our hair follicles. So, the blood flow theory proponents are being really clever with this hypothesis since they're not trying to dispute the proven role of androids in hair loss because they'd have no chance of proving that, but rather what they're doing is that they're saying that the blood flow is what causes this particular pattern of male pattern baldness due to the effect of blood flow on androgen levels. This is in spite of the fact that interventions that really do improve blood circulation to the scalp, such as, you know, cardiovascular training as well as blood pressure medications such as ACE inhibitors and vasodilators do not promote hair growth. Now, minoxidil I know is a blood pressure medication, but its mechanism isn't related to its vasodilating effects, because if that were the case, then also other vasodilators like hydralazine would improve hair growth. So even though there are several theories as to how minoxidil works, none of the theories involve increased blood flow, but that hasn't stopped professional bullshit artists from claiming that blood flow has a role in hair loss, because if con artists can convince consumers that any particular product promotes hair growth through the blood flow mechanism, then that gives them the justification to say their product works, since they can say like, Hey guys, this thing also promotes blood flow to the scalp, so it must work too, right? So besides the fact that changing blood flow with exercise or drugs has no effect on androgenic alopecia whatsoever, we also know that transplanted hair from the areas of low scalp tension to areas of high scalp tension don't miniaturize, and also that hairs transplanted from areas of high scalp tension to low scalp tension don't suddenly just become normal hairs. We know this from one of the first studies ever done on hair transplantation from a Dr. Orntreich, which was published in 1959, where he showed that the characteristics of the transplanted hairs depended only on the donor site and not on the recipient sites. So even if you were to take hair from the temples or the crown where the scalp tension is high and then transplant those hairs to areas of the body where the scalp tension is low, like the back of your head for instance, the hairs would still miniaturize despite the low scalp tension and higher oxygen levels. In fact, this classic paper from 1959 even talks about the blood flow theory and flat out debunks bunks it based on this demonstration of what's been called donor dominance. Dr. Orntreich wrote, quote, this study would seem to refute theories of the pathogenesis of ordinary human baldness based solely on the chronic activity of the scalp muscles via branches of the facial nerves that lead to shearing stresses in the dermis of the scalp and consequent ischemia, unquote. In other words, tension of the scalp muscles causing lack of oxygen, which is what ischemia is, does not cause baldness at all, so basically the blood flow theory was literally debunked 62 years ago. But let me tell you, the funny thing about this whole blood flow theory is that as of not Noxious as it is, it seemed like it was dying down a bit as a topic of serious discussion in the hair loss community, especially after I, th after I thoroughly trashed it in my review of HairGuard's Grow Band product, which I'll link below and I highly recommend you view it as it is a very great video which I am very proud of, but recently it seems there has been an increase in online chatter about the blood flow theory where people are like, wait a minute, not so fast Kevin, you may be wrong about the blood flow theory because there's some new data out there which seems very convincing. So, it seems pretty funny that there would be new data proving that the blood flow theory improves hair growth since there have been scam products being so sold and promoted as stopping hair loss by improving blood flow for well over a century now at least. So it would be pretty remarkable if now all of a sudden after decades of bullshit blood flow products that don't work that we discover that the blood flow theory is actually suddenly true. So come on and join me my friends and let's take a look at this new research that has generated a level of drama in the hair loss community that hasn't been seen since I told some portrait 
Portuguese guy on Reddit that has claimed that broccoli is the cure for hair loss is a bunch of bullshit. So what is this new breakthrough that proves that Blutflu is the solution to stopping the slaphead curse? Well, believe it or not, it's a toxin known as botulinum, which is otherwise known as Botox, which is an FDA-approved drug for treating migraines as well as fine lines and wrinkles. But keep in mind that the botulinum toxin is one of the deadliest substances on the planet to the human organism. In fact, doses as low as 1.2 to 2.1 nanograms per kilogram in the human body are completely lethal. So this is not something you want to mess around with yourself. It needs to be administered by a medical professional. So how does this toxin work exactly? Well, the main effect is to prevent the release of acetylcholine from the nerves. And for those who don't know what acetylcholine is, it's a neurotransmitter released by the nerves, which is a key component to the process of muscle contraction, and thus suppressing it causes paralysis. The bacteria is called Clostridium botulinum, and it can be found in food if it is improperly canned, and if you eat it, you can develop botulism, which can be fatal, as all of your muscles will go into paralysis, including the muscles responsible for breathing, which can cause death by asphyxiation. So, despite all this, medical science has miraculously found ways to make this lethal toxin useful. Like I said, Botox injections are commonly used in the face to prevent wrinkles by paralyzing the muscles in the face, which causes the muscles to subsequently relax relax and stretch out the wrinkles. It's a temporary effect though, which is why subsequent injections are necessary. Like I said though, it is also used to treat migraine headaches, but the mechanism by which it works for migraines is not completely understood, but may have something to do with other effects of Botox, including effects on cytokines, which may be relevant when we're talking about using Botox as a treatment for hair loss, which we'll be getting into more detail soon enough. But the reason Botox is only now being hyped to support the brute food theory of hair loss is the idea that it can be used to relax the tension of the scalp muscles and thus improve blood flow to the scalp. So if Botox injections promote hair growth in the scalp, then that must prove the blood flow theory is correct after all, and I've been wrong in my assertions this whole time, right? Well, not so fast, Jooms. Before you get your credit cards out to buy your grow bands and buy some bullshit online guide about free drug hair loss remedies that don't involve anything other than natural treatments and, you know, standing on your head and scalp massages, I think it's first best that we take a look at the actual data and go balls deep as we usually do to see if it holds up to scrutiny. So the first study that looked at Botox and androgenic alopecia together appeared in a letter to the editor from 2010 that was from two doctors from Ontario Maple Syrup Land, which was entitled, quote, Treatment of Male Pattern Baldness with Botulinum Toxin, a pilot study, unquote. So the researchers here looked at 50 men aged 19 to 57 who had male pattern baldness ranging from severity of Norwood 2 to Norwood 4. Each man got two 24-week treatment cycles of Botox, 150 units, which was injected into the scalp muscles at 30 different sites. So to assess the results, the researchers used photographs to do hair counts in a 2-centimeter area and also measured hair loss by the number of hairs found on the subject's pillows. The subjects also filled out questionnaires. These are both pretty subjective of uh, metrics to measure any kind of study, especially in a study where there is no placebo control group since they all knew they were getting Botox. And if you know you're getting a treatment that is all new and hyped up, that certainly can cause a placebo effect and influence the answers on things like a self-assessment. So a much better objective measurement would have been to use something like a, uh, a tool, like a phototrichogram, which can measure exact hair count changes as well as other parameters like hair thickness, the ratio of hairs in the antigen growth phase versus the telogen resting phase, and other objective factors. Anyways, as you can see in this table here, they found an 18% increase in hair count, a decrease in pillow hairs, and supposedly an improvement in subjective evaluation. Though the table says that the subjective evaluation went from 20 before Botox to 19 after 48 weeks of Botox. So what do these numbers mean? I have no goddamn idea because the researchers never bothered to tell us anything about the details, which isn't surprising since this is, after all, just a letter to the editors and not a full-blown peer-reviewed study. In this letter, the researchers say, quote, hair regrowth was objectively visible in sub-subjects, unquote. And here is their figure in figure one showing that. The authors then attribute the effects to the blood flow theory, but as we'll see later, these results can be explained by other factors that Botox is responsible for that weren't known at the time of this study, so you got to give the researchers a pass here. 
So this letter to the editors is pretty rough stuff overall. It's definitely not a quality peer-reviewed study, and without a control group, this isn't a good study design either. Another big problem we see here is that the study was supported by Allergan Inc., who just happened to be the manufacturers of Botox, and the investigators were claiming intellectual property rights related to the, quote, process described in the study, unquote. So there is definitely some potential bias here, but bias alone doesn't prove a study is wrong. But these results are very preliminary, so let's see what other studies have been done for on Botox for hair loss in the past decade. So even if you are convinced by the last study, the next study is a bit of a downer. It is from 2016 and it is titled, quote, Frontal alopecia and repeated botulinum toxin type A injections for forehead wrinkles, an underestimated entity, unquote. This study is a case report of five females, aged 45 to 58, who developed progressive recession of their hairline after periodic injection of Botox into their foreheads. Right here, you can see what these poor women's hairs look like. Now, the researchers do bring up the 2010 study we just mentioned, but they weren't too impressed by it, and you know, who can blame them? They say the results were poor. As you can see from this quote here, they then talk a little bit more about the blood flu theory, but they also mentioned that changes in neurotransmitter levels may affect cytokines, which are growth factors which might be an alternative theory as to why Botox might affect hair growth, which we'll get into later. Anyways, even though the results here are pretty bad, as they show the women got hair loss from Botox, I don't think we should worry too much about this study, because it is just a case report involving five women, and I haven't seen any other reports like this one. Also, the other studies we're about to look at don't really show this negative effect from Botox, so this case report might just be an outlier, so let's go ahead and move on. So now we're getting closer to the present with the year 2017, where we have yet another pilot study, and this time it's from India, and it is titled, quote, a pilot study to evaluate effectiveness of botulinum toxin in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia in males, unquote. The researchers looked at just 10 male patients aged 22 to 42 years who were uh, who had Norwood levels ranging from 2 to 4 again. They used the same dose of Botox as the first pilot study, which was 150 units total injected into 30 sites that you can see here. And this time, they just looked at one set of injections and then followed the subjects for 24 weeks. Like in the first pilot study, they used photo photographs and self-assessments rather than an objective measuring tool like a photo trichogram. But anyways, you can see some of the results in these photographs here. The researchers felt that based on the photos that eight patients had a good to excellent response. One had a poor response and one had a fair response. The self-assessment was similar with seven patients thinking they had a good to excellent response, two fair and one poor. So this is a pretty subjective study with no real hard data like hair counts, but I guess that's why it's, it was just a pilot study after all. So other than the sketchy study design, this study like the earlier one also lacks a true control group. So for all we know, maybe it was just the needling itself that had an effect and we would have seen the same effect if they had just injected a saline solution since the needling may have caused inflammation and the release of growth factors. Who knows? This is unlikely, but without a proper control group, how do we know that the Botox did anything at all? Well, not to worry because we've got some more shitty studies coming up, so strap in, we're not quite done yet. Next, we have another small study, and this one is from China, published in 2018. It is titled, quote, a small dose of botulinum toxin A is effective for treating androgenetic alopecia in Chinese patients, unquote. Sadly, this is yet another letter to the editor rather than a full-blown peer-reviewed study, but let's go ahead and take a look at it anyways. The researchers looked at 25 males aged 30 to 45 years of age with androgenetic alopecia. This time, though, the researchers used a smaller dose of only 50 units of Botox total, but also given at 30 sites in the scalp like in the previous studies. The researchers evaluated hair care counts and what they refer to as, quote, grease content, which I guess means SIBA production. So they looked at this grease content and the hair counts at three months and then six months after the injections. Once again, though, there was no control group that just got some sham placebo injections, so we have no idea how this Botox treatment would have compared to no treatment, which is a shame, because we are talking about China here, after all, where 99% of everything they consider to be medicine is actually just a placebo. So it would have been really easy to have a control group in this study. Now, the researchers don't give us the actual hair counts, rather they just summarize the results. So at three months, nine patients showed improvement, 10 patients showed no improvement, and five patients showed continuous 
continue hair loss. 19 of the patients had a decrease in grease secretion. Then at six months, 11 patients showed what the researchers described as, quote, remarkable hair growth, unquote. Eight patients showed minimal improvement, and five patients showed no response. Meanwhile, the grease production was, quote, gradually restored to normal, unquote, and, quote, close to healthy level, unquote. So, cool story, bro. Anyways, this figure shows a representative patient, but since there is l so little data in this letter to the editor, and since there is no control group, it is difficult to say anything other than maybe Botox is effective, but we clearly need more data here. So let's go ahead and move on to the next study, which again is actually just a letter to the editor. This time the study comes from Good Korea, and it is from 2020. Now despite just being a letter to the editor, this one is more interesting than the other ones we have seen so far, because it gets into the true mechanism as to why Botox may regrow hair, rather than just assuming it is because of the blood flow theory. So why is it that Botox may work for reasons other than just blood flow? Well, recent research indicates that Botox doesn't just relax muscles, it also has an effect on growth factors. In fact, it has been shown that Botox inhibits secretion of the growth factor known as TGF-beta-1 from fibroblasts, which you may remember me being, bringing up in my video where I absolutely demolished Hans Amato's idiotic article about why he thinks DHT doesn't cause hair loss, which I'll go ahead and link below in case you haven't seen it yet. But if you want to have a refresher on what TGF-beta-1 is, what it basically is is that it's just another growth factor linked to hair growth like IGF-1. However, unless like IGF-1, which promotes hair growth, TGF-beta-1 is a negative growth factor that actually inhibits hair growth. So if Botox inhibits TGF-beta-1, it could affect hair growth without any effect on scalp tension or blood flow. But you'll never hear this talked about since you can't sell worthless repurposed blood pressure cuffs based on growth factors in the scalp. So to test this much more plausible theory about why Botox works, these investigators actually looked at the effects of Botox on TGF-beta-1 production, specifically in cultured dermal papilla cells in an in vitro study, and they also did a human study designed like the pilot studies we have seen so far, except this time they just injected the Botox into the skin of the scalp and not into the muscles to see if it worked without reducing scalp tension. So they're putting the scalp tension theory directly to the test here. But anyways, the researchers used a lot less Botox than in the previous studies, only 30 units in fact, and at 20 different sites. But they did get the Botox more frequently, every four weeks this time for a total of 24 weeks to the subjects, and they measured hair counts with an actual phototrichogram this time to give objective measurements rather than using subjective me measurements or just plain photographs that can be influenced by factors unrelated to hair loss like lighting, hairstyling, as well as certain angles. So. Looking at the in vitro study results first, the investigators did find that the evil trash hormone DHT increased TGF-beta-1 levels in cultured human hair dermal papilla cells after 96 hours. But when they used DHT with Botox together, TGF-beta-1 levels went down, as you can see here. In the in vivo human studies, photodricograms showed that the average hair counts went from 129 at baseline levels up to 136 at 24 weeks. So nothing huge, but still big enough to be a significant difference. So just like in the other pilot studies that we've looked at, Botox did seem to have an effect on hair growth. However, this study showed that the effect can be achieved even without any muscle relaxation since the Botox was not injected into the, into the muscles, which means that the effectiveness of Botox for, for regrowing hair is linked to its effect on suppressing the negative growth factor TGF-beta-1, and it has nothing at all to do with its muscle relaxing properties. So scalp tension and blood flow has nothing at all to to do with any of this. So the authors then hypothesize that if you inject it intramuscularly, you still get the same effect as if you were to inject it into the skin because the Botox just diffuses to the scalp from the muscles, so there's no real advantage to injecting it into the muscles, and it might even work better if you just inject it directly into the skin. So finally, let's go ahead and move on to the last study because this is the one everybody is getting all excited about. It is the biggest and most recent of all the studies we've gone over. This one is from China from 2020, and it is titled quote, effectiveness and safety of botulinum toxin type A in the treatment of androgenic alopecia, unquote. Believe it or not, this one is a real study and not just a letter to the editor. So in this study, the researchers looked at 63 patients with androgenic alopecia ranging from Norwood 2 to 4 and divided them into two randomized groups. The first group got Botox alone and the other group got Botox plus finasteride at one milligram per day. Once again, though, like every other Botox study on hair loss we've 
seen thus far, there is no true control group that received a placebo. So even though it's nice we have a group that is already on a clinically proven treatment like finasteride, it would have yielded better data if they had a third group that was on either just a placebo or just on finasteride alone because we want to see how Botox compares to finasteride or to nothing. So anyways, the subjects received the Botox injections every three months for four sets of injections, and this time they used 100 units of Botox at 30 sites. But like all the other studies except for the last one, the injections were in the muscle. The researchers also just used subjective measurements again, including photos to assess hair counts, as well as having dermatologists and the patients assess the overall results. Again, not a good metric since all these subject, all these uh, metrics can be subject to bias. But anyways, looking at the results, First off, the groups were well matched without any significant differences as you can see here in this table. And both groups showed improvement in hair counts over time, but Botox plus finasteride did better than Botox alone, as you can see in this table. Average hair count was 218 with Botox, but 234 with Botox plus finasteride. The dermatologist didn't think there was any difference between Botox and Botox plus finasteride, as seen in this table, but there was better patient satisfaction in patients who took Botox plus finasteride versus Botox alone. And if you look at the po photos provided in the study, it does look like Botox plus finasteride asteroid was better, but again, these were just subjective measurements, so we really can't make much out of them. In the discussion, the researchers sadly, again, attribute all this to the blood flu theory, so maybe the other paper we just mentioned on TGF-beta-1 hadn't appeared yet, or they hadn't bothered to read it. In any case, this is just speculation on their part, and they clearly aren't up to date on the more recent discoveries about how Botox works, like in the previous study from Good Korea, because if Botox worked from just relaxing the muscles and promoting blood flow because of uh, reduced scalp tension, then why did it work just as well when it was administered directly into the skin where it didn't come into contact with the muscles? All we can really say from the study is that finasteride works because Botox plus finasteride was better than Botox alone. We don't know though if Botox is actually better than placebo because they didn't look at that. In fact, no study has any control group at all, so the theory behind Botox being a viable hair loss treatment hasn't even been established yet, but if it does work, it certainly isn't because of the blood flow theory. Also, again, all these studies have pretty soft endpoints, such as using visual examinations, self-assessments, as well as just photographs, rather than using a tool like a phototrichogram. And even in the one good study from Good Korea that did use a phototrichogram, it did not look at other parameters you can measure with a phototrichogram, including hair thickness, percentage of hairs in the antigen versus intelligent phase, percentage of miniaturized hairs, and other factors. So there is still a lot of ground they could have covered to give us better data, but for some reason they chose not to. Still, I'd rather trust data about hair loss from good Korea than communist China. However, even though the data isn't particularly strong, I can't rule out the fact that Botox may potentially have some effect on hair growth, but it's not clear how well it works or whether it can cause harm if there are any repeated injections. Because if you remember in that case study involving women, they actually lost hair after repeated injections. So who knows if long-term use would be safe? And lastly, I have to emphasize again that even if it does work, it is not because it affects scalp tension or blood flow. Otherwise, the study where it was just injected into the skin would have yielded no results. So it is blatantly obvious that the much better theory here is that Botox may work by its effect on negative growth factors like TGF-beta-1, which Botox inhibits rather than blood flu or scalp tension. But overall, I wouldn't get too excited about injecting the most poisonous substance known to man into my scalp, especially since we know from the last study we went over that finasteride works better than Botox, and also that finasteride has much better long-term research, including studies that show it maintains all of its efficacy even after 10 years of usage. I mean, who knows what would happen if we were to repeatedly inject Botox into our scalps every month after 10 years. I think I'd rather just take a pill and be done with it. Frankly though, I think the only reason why Botox has been, a lot, been getting a lot of attention as of late is because hair loss scammers want to use it to try to legitimize the blood flu theory and bring consumers down the blood flu pipeline, which will lead them to buying worthless scam products that are marketed as working by improving blood flu to the scalp. But unfortunately for them, this video exists. So please guys, stop trying to make blood flu and scalp tension a thing. It's all been debunked. You're just making fools out of yourself and you're putting people's hair at risk. And with that, I think I got a galaxy to save and I have a blue alien to get the nasty on with. It's time to play some Mass Effect. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.